with WWE threatened with legal action and more. This is Wrestling Hub. My name is John and you're watching the Wrestling Report. Before we get into the rest of the video, make sure you subscribe to Wrestling Hub and turn on all notifications to stay up to date with everything in the world of pro wrestling. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Wrestling Hub Official and follow us on Twitter at Wrestling underscore Hub. Touching on the ending to the Blood and Guts match in 2021 where Chris Jericho fell off a cage and landed on a crash pad, Dax Harwood said on his FTR podcast, yeah, that finish, the ending, how it went down, did kind of suck. It wasn't the fault of any of the performers. I just think that again, this was during the pandemic era, so we were all working without a net on how to shoot things. Daly's place kind of made it a little difficult to shoot, but that's the cards we were dealt. First Blood and Guts match ever in AEW, and again, like I said, working on live TV without a net. So the way it was shot is the reason that the fans soured on it. And again, I don't blame the cameraman or the directors, the producers, nobody knew. It was just those are the cards that we were dealt. So when I say that, it was the way it was shot. I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that we were all still in the process of learning how to deal with this pandemic era style of wrestling. I thought the idea for the finish was great. I thought that the execution going into it was done well. It's just the way it was shot probably could have been thought through a little bit more considered during the small confines of the dailies place. Talking about Jeff Hardy's debut for AEW, Matt Hardy revealed on his Extreme Life podcast, Tony Khan takes the non-compete clause as serious as a heart attack, is the old saying. He just won't do it. He feels it's not worthwhile to do. The way that deal went is we know I'm turning babyface at some point. It turns out Jeff's no-compete clause ends on a Tuesday and there's a dynamite the next night. I was going to turn babyface regardless if Jeff came or not. There were no Jeff plans. They didn't make Jeff creative plans. Tony refused to do that only after jeff got released from wwe i could have turned babyface done a program with andrade for four weeks or whatever and then jeff could have showed up there were no plans at that time for jeff Recalling an angle for Bret Hart that never came to be in WWE, former writer for the company Court Bauer told Talk is Jericho, the best idea that I pitched that didn't get used. There was a lot of circumstances that happened. All right. What about the Hart family led by Bret versus the McMahon family? So we started looking at that and it's like, well, you've got Shane, Hunter, Stephanie. And then we were like, how do we fill this out with younger kids? Seeing as though it was going to be a brawl-like match without in-ring bumps, the writer had pitched Chris Jericho Davey Boy Smith, Teddy Hart, and the unsigned Natalia and Tyson Kidd for Brett's team. While McMahon's faction was pitched, Shawn Michaels, Paul London, Brian Kendrick, and Brian Danielson. Brett ultimately said, yeah, no. I remember Vince saying, hold on, I'll call Brett and pitch it right now. This is surreal. Last I knew, Vince got punched out by Brett. So then you get to hear Vince pitch a top guy, and those conversations usually happen far away from everyone. Initially, Hart agreed, but then backed out within 40 eight hours but from that came natty being signed tj being signed and a lot of other things that would lead to other great stuff just not what we had hoped for When it comes to a possible return to the largest MMA promotion for Brock Lesnar, UFC President Dana White told Sports Illustrated, Brock and I have a great relationship, and we always have, but I don't think Brock wants to fight anymore. Brock's made a lot of money. He came into the UFC and won the heavyweight title. He's got nothing left to prove. I don't think he'd want to do it. With it believed that Brock Lesnar turned down working with Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania, Dutch Mantel said this about it on Storytime. Brock don't want to mess with it. What if he beats him? I mean, what if Brock beats Bray Wyatt? Am I going to be mad? No. Is it going to help Brock? No. And you know Bray's not beating him because that's not happening, period. Because they know Brock. You know, when Brock brings a problem, it's not like, ah, uh, well, he'll come around and do it. No, Brock won't come around. Brock's a multi-millionaire. He'll just get up and walk out the door and keep going. So they just can't do anything they want to do with Brock because, you know, they have built their own, I don't know how to say it, they've built a monster in Brock because he don't need your money anymore, but he's damn sure not going to go into some that he views as a lesser angle with Bray Wyatt.
Talking about potential matchups for him in AEW, Paul White told Deuce and Mo, there are a couple of guys I want to work with. I definitely want to work with Kenny Omega at some point. I'm totally fascinated by a lot of stuff Kenny Omega does. Kenny and I could have a great big man, little man match. I have zero doubts in my mind we could rip the roof off the building. Powerhouse Hobbs, Wardlow, even Darby Allen. I'd probably have to be a bad guy to compete against Darby Allen, but if I was a bad guy competing against Darby Allen, I could have the place rioting because he does such a good job with his character of selling and fighting from underneath. Lance Archer is another one. Orange Cassidy would be fun to play with, maybe tag with. As an opponent, he'd probably irritate the hell out of me, but as a tag partner, he'd be a lot of fun. I always tease Dark Order that I'm a card-carrying member of Dark Order and I'm going to join Dark Order. There are so many great talents that whatever we put together, we're going to have fun with. We have Satnam Singh, who is 7'2". He's a little green right now, but at some point, if I tag with him and show him how to tag team wrestle as a giant, that would be fun. And maybe down the road split up into a few there. The landscape is wide open to do whatever. As Rey Mysterio is set to be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, Drew McIntyre paid tribute to the star at a recent live event. Here's the video. I'm lucky enough to be around this man for 15 years. Legend doesn't cut it. He's been in the Hall of Fame five times over. He keeps getting younger the more I get older. He wouldn't tell me where the fountain of youth is. Look at the man. He gets better and younger every single year. Ray, thank you. To be a friend, a brother, a mentor, for just being you. We are so lucky to still be in your presence. And more than deserve congratulations for being in the Hall of Fame. You deserve your own way, brother. Thank you. Also at a WWE live event, Liv Morgan would put Shayna Baszler through a table. With WWE referring to Liv Morgan as the Queen of Extreme, the one who originally used that nickname, ECW legend Francine, responded to WWE and threatened legal action, saying on her YouTube channel, I mean, they've called her Queen of Extreme before Liv Morgan. We've talked about the Queen of Extreme Liv Morgan tried to use it too. And you know, I filed to trademark that. I don't know, it's been maybe six months too close to a year now that I'm waiting for, because it takes some time to go through. You can't just do it and then tomorrow you have it done. It's a big process. It takes time. And I mean, I've been using it now. It's over 25 years going on 30 years. I appreciate the love. Please don't get me wrong, but so many people were just like, hey, did you hear Corey Graves said this? And I'm just like, okay, first of all, I'm never mad. I wouldn't be mad at Amy or Lita. I wouldn't be mad at her. You know, she's not going around saying it, finding her niche. Well, maybe she is. I don't know. Not that I know of. But my concern over this whole thing is I don't want them to try and trademark it and then tell me you can't use it anymore because I've been using it for for almost three decades. And that's what like some people don't understand. Like one guy was like, oh, get over it. You're not relevant anymore. You passed the torch or whatever. And I was just like, that's not the point. She doesn't need the torch passed to her. She's a star. She's a star in herself. She doesn't need me to help her. My thing is what people don't understand is when you establish a character and a gimmick and a name and you use that for years and years and years and years, you don't pass that name onto somebody, you know? It's not like I'm doing every indie show that I can working ringside, you know, at 51 years old, saying I can hang with the younger talent. No, that's not what I'm trying to do. Like, I'm just trying to hold on to my legacy in this business. And that is the name that I have used. That is the name that people know me by. So why would I just give it away and let other people use it? And people don't understand. It's not that I don't want to pass the torch or share knowledge. I know my time in the ring is over. Now, if I'm used for anything, I'm not trying to make that big comeback. I've said this a million times. You don't see me in the ring every weekend. That's not my deal that's not what I'm trying to do. What I will fight for is that name because I've worked hard and I've used it for so many years. So I finally said, okay, we're going to do a trademark on it. And you know, Stephen P. New was nice enough to put the trademark in for me. And now we are waiting to make it finalized. I didn't get a lot of hate on it. I got a lot of positivity, but I just hope that people aren't looking at me saying, oh my God, get over it. You're so old or your time has passed. It's not about me trying to stay relevant. It's just about what I've worked hard for. And I feel like I've earned that name. And 
I've used it for so long. It would be weird if I can't use it anymore. And for them to take it away from me because they can't take my name. I said this before, like in my contract when I worked there, Francine was borrowed because it's my birth name. So they can't tell me not to use that name because I was born with it, right? But for them to turn around and say, well, you can't be known as the queen of extreme anymore, that would be horrible. Whether I'm in this business another day or another 30 years from now, if I do conventions, I'm going to sign the queen of extreme Francine and I'm going to get that trademark. And if they continue to use it, we're going to file a cease and desist. And that's it because they would do it to me. It's not me being bitter or, you know, trying to be a jerk about things. I'm trying to protect my brand and protect what I worked hard for. And you know, maybe I'm not doing a lot now, but that's my decision. That is my choice. I'm not busy every week and that is by choice. I do get a lot of offers. I can be on the road every weekend if I want to be. I cannot because of my family. I physically can't do it. You know, so the little bit that I do, I'm going to protect it. So I'm not calling the girls out. I'm calling the company out and I'm saying, listen, that's not your name to use. That's my name. Taking to Twitter, a fan would accuse a WWE star of liking a transphobic post as it reads, Valentina Faroz liked a video of a politician making fun of trans women and saying men who want to be women are taking the place of real women. My friend confronted her and this was her response. She then unliked the post and blocked my friend afterwards. Valentina responded writing, I'm here to apologize for what happened on my Instagram. I support and protect trans rights. I support respect, love, and peace. Love always overcomes hate and prejudice. And this was your pro wrestling news update. I hope you're all having a great day. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see y'all later.